There was a, a critic of New York Times um, um, written by the former Kubrick assistant claiming it's a uh, nonsense and that the, the theory about the writing machine was completely absurd and so on. Mm -hmm. So you, you met him after that? Oh, no, I, um, I met him at a festival after, the, after that. Mm. Um, no, and I, and, 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 um, no, and I like him a lot. Um, I mean, I can, I, can deb I, can, I can debate his comments from the New York Times, but for the most part, I mean, 237 is a project about you know, being open to you know all sorts of ideas. So there's no reason that I should necessarily <laughs> try to debate his. But um, he, the whole idea, you know, of Room Two Three Seven is questioning who gets to decide what a movie is about. Mm -hmm. Is it the filmmaker? Is it the critics? Is it academics? Is it the audience? Is it someone who worked on the set? You know, um, is it someone who makes a documentary about it 30 years later? Um, and it's a question that, you know, although we ask, I don't think, you know, we're, we necessarily answer definitively. That's why the movie is very interesting, because it's all about questioning uh, not only the movie, but the process of, uh, of idea. Mm -hmm. But, um, and uh, did you try to get in touch with other um, former colleagues of Stanley Kubrick's, or was it the only one you no, met? No, 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 from the, well, I mean, from the beginning, the whole project was about how does the audience put together a challenging, you know, movie like The Shining after 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 the filmmaker's done with it, you know, using only the tools that they have at hand. And, you know, our different the different people that we talk to are all very different. They have different experiences in different backgrounds, um, and they bring something different to their look at the film. You know, what they so. That was the story we wanted to tell, not a behind-the-scenes story, and mm. it didn't seem necessarily fair if you know these folks really were working based on the film and their own research for us to then go to the cameraman who they might not have access to and say, "Is that right? Is that wrong?" No, no, no for sure. Sorry, yeah, no, for no, it's sure. Fine. So, I, it's absolutely not what I meant. I was more curious of how would you respond to the. Um, to their feedbacks, is it because of course what is, is interesting in your movie, it leaves everything yeah. open, even if in the website it says no any, I think it was written something like uh, many ways in, no way out, yeah. but there are many ways, I mean you know you can go in and out, it, it was more out of curiosity to know yeah. what kind of feedback did you have, you know. But well it's interesting, Leon Vitale is the only member, you know, of the of, of the crew. No, I met, actually I met him and I met a woman who worked with Jack Nicholson. Um, and what's kind of disappointing, well for, for the one thing, at a certain point I only asked a couple of questions and then I didn't want to be a nuisance. Um, but, you know, I asked her if she remembered, I asked both of them if they knew where that Playgirl magazine had come from. <laughs> <laughs> and neither of them knew, which was, yeah. which, which, so, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't come close to answering anything. Um, you know, and and for me, one thing that Leon Vitale said in the New York Times article was that that Calumet can that was in the pantry was put there for another reason, for its color or you know for its iconic meaning. But that's all well and good, but the reason the, that's not the answer that would disqualify what Bill Blakemore saw as being important. The answer that would have disqualified it was that. Oh, there was just a ton of garbage that was put there by the set designer, and none of us looked at it or had anything to think about it before they walked on the set. And that's not what he said. He said it was picked carefully, but for another reason. Oh. Although, even if, but you see, there's always an out of any of these, which is why it's you know so kind of wonderful, but also kind of maddening, that even if neither Kubrick nor Leon Vitali had seen were involved in that choice, if strictly the art director had put it there, well. We'd have to talk to the art director and say, "Well, why did you choose it?" And he might not even, and he might have chosen it consciously for a reason like what Bill Blakemore says, or he might have picked it subconsciously, in which case he would certainly have no idea. But you know, <laughs> or it even might have been an accident, <laughs> like they're running, like I don't know, for the um, <laughs> Doppy, is it the name of the dwarf Doppy? Yes, yes. Yeah, for instance, Doppy might have disappeared because I don't know, they have to repent the, you know, the yeah, war yeah. whatsoever. So. Well, you know, and 
in accidents being meaningful is only one, you know, there's a hundred gradations between Kubrick put this here in the movie for this reason and only for this reason, and, you know, the bottom where is a complete accident. But, mm -hmm. and even a complete accident can mean something for all sorts of people, but between those two extremes, there's a thousand sh there's a thousand shades of gray between all the people who could have been involved in the decision and all the and if it's one person responsible for all the accidents you know that they can certain that you know Freud would say that those accidents might add up after a while and you don't know what part of your personality is like why this poster instead of this poster why this can instead of this can if it's the same person making those choices time and time again it may well say something about about, about them or what's going on in their head um, you know that's the indirect answer you know because we're talking with a film about a filmmaker who is so involved in the process and who does so much research and is so meticulous mm. there's more reason in his movies than other people's movies mm. to think that little details are made intentionally. <laughs> that's right. That's why it's so interesting about your movie, about the movie. So, of course, uh, for me, one of the main questions is, is what, was it your choice from the beginning or was it the exegetist choice not to be shown? That was from the beginning. When I, when, I thought, when I interviewed these people, I didn't even record any video. We only recorded audio. Yeah, well, I had done a short film a few, maybe a year or so before I started Room 237 that um, was a documentary where I only recorded sound and I didn't show people's faces. And mm -hmm. I liked the way that it sort of put the whole project into a, maybe a different part of your head, more into your imagination mm -hmm. than sort of the you know, nuts and bolts reality. Um, that you know a more straightforward documentary would have. Um, so we went further with that in room 237 and it started to do really interesting things about um, if nothing else I like the idea that maybe you know we're not looking at these people but we're seeing the world through their eyes mm. or we're trying to see the movie through their eyes you know and it also kind of when you pull the voice away from the person it may be that you know we're judging we, we give people an opportunity to judge ideas separately from personalities sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, though it's funny, I know a lot of... Um, there, are, you know, there, there, are, there are other interesting things that the audio-only approach does, though a lot of them are sort of intellectualizations, sort of intellectual, intellectualizations that I've made after the fact, which, you know, I think goes also a lot to argue against a filmmaker being necessarily the most objective person to explain why something is in a movie. <laughs> because, you know, I've read people have written things about it, like somebody has written that, you know, it's because you don't see them, these people are ghosts in the movie the way there are ghosts in the Overlook Hotel. And I'm like, oh, that's great, and that's really evocative. Mm -hmm. The idea hadn't occurred to me, but I'm tempted to steal that as my own idea for the next time I talk <laughs> about the movie, uh, which yeah. would totally make me, and, and I'm sure other filmmakers have done exactly that, which is another reason not to rely solely on what a filmmaker says as an explanation <laughs> for why something appear, why, why something's in a movie. If I, if, if, if I can be skeptical of this theory that's skeptical of my movie, I, know. I would say, well, why couldn't we shoot them if they were fake? And certainly that in, in the short documentary, I did the Yes from Hell. There are lots of people, you know, who suspected that the whole thing was fake, and that the interviews were fake, and that they mm -hmm. were all actors, you know, reading, re reading from from scripts. And you know, my initial reaction is that that's great. You know, that if you know, two three seven is an exercise about explaining the mysteries of The Shining. If people start to see mysteries in room 237, I couldn't be happy. It, this couldn't be a more successful... I've seen the movie, so I wouldn't have just telling you so, but seeing the movie, I, and I knew it would be, uh, even if it's a really twisted interpre interpretation, I, I knew you would, could kind of buy it, you know? Yeah, well, there's been some interesting interpretations of 237 that appeared. There's one that was really great. This guy was listening to one of the commentators say, um, talk about like there's I think it's John Paul Ryan maybe describing um, how people understand how, pe how people understand movies and um, you know, sort of visual culture and that they say he says like, it's about you know what people are seeing and not seeing mm. and this guy heard watched the movie and said um, 
It's interesting that you said not seeing, like Nazis, <laughs> like World War II. And if you yeah. think about it, the yeah. professor is not seeing the movie by putting it in context oh. with World War II and the Holocaust. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I the you know, so if this was a fake, that would have been like a very, that would have been a very nice touch mm-hmm. to have to, to have made that line evocative of that right. idea. It would have been like pale fire or something. It's amazing. It's crazy. What I really enjoy about the movie is when it starts. It starts with this shot from uh, Eyes Wide Shut. Mm-hmm. When Tom Cruise gets into the movie, oh, you sure. see Shining. And the very minute the um, theatre door closes, here comes the credit, room 237. And uh, I notice it's your choice because the interviewer speaks about 2001 many times. And also I've been reading a little um, Buzz saying that it's a kind of metaphor of Tom Cruise being initiated to society, uh, secret society. Sure. So I guess that's why you picked up, um, of course he goes to see Shining, but I, I guess it's why you focused about this very movie, uh, is it? Well, certainly what's interesting about you know talking about The Shining is very quickly you start talking about other Kubrick films because mm. they all sort of relate. and. There's, you know, complicated themes that recur within each one. So it's almost impossible to talk about any Kubrick film in a vacuum um, mm-hmm. if, if you're not, if, if you don't also open up the door to some of the others. You know, Eyes Wide Shut is the one more than the others that, like, if there was a number two film for generating this kind of you know, contemporary focus, symbolic mm-hmm. analysis, it would be Eyes Wide Shut. They come the, the rainbow fashion. Oh, we're getting, the models who say we're coming from one, we're coming, we're, we're going over the rainbow, mm-hmm. and then it's rainbow fashions where he gets the where, where he where he gets the costume, mm-hmm. and they actually there are people who get into the um, conspiracy idea of like there's like a government mind control program called Monarch, and that also ties into the skiing poster and eyes in The Shining, but people see eyes wide shut through that prism too. So they go on and on. And, and there's something about like women from fairy tales and like Tom Cruise's and Nicole Kidman's characters and Alice. Um, mm. And you know, it's you know, a, and, and it's a movie that's inspired by you know um, a Freudian novel. You yeah, know, that's slower, right? Yeah, that's uh, that's in its title talks about it being a dream, which explains why, you know, its logic is very you know kind of stream of consciousness, um, and you know, and because he died before it was released, you know, there's lots of speculation that maybe he would maybe it would have been, maybe he would have it wouldn't have been exactly the same movie mm. if he kept working on it. What would that have been? You know, so um, there's endless speculation around that movie. You know, Eyes Wide Shut is the, the secret society and that ritual that occurs towards the end, you know, is reminiscent of, a re- of, of, of one that occurs in the real world. Um, mm-hmm. um, and that, that was sort of dangerous territory for, for, for Kubrick to be wading into. Um, but there's also all kinds of things about the city and like the layout of the, the, the layout of the city and where the buildings are in relationship to each other. The Verona Cafe, is it Verona? Um, it's got a 23, it has 237 as the address. Um, and there are clear, and there are clearly things, you know, like signs and numbers and things that the same sort of play that happens in The Shining happens within Eyes Wide Shut. There's that scene near the end where Tom Cruise is being followed and if you look at the newsstand, the newspaper says, lucky to be alive, which at this point in the movie he is. Um, so those interrelations get 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 really interesting and Eyes Wide Shut gets very eerie. Um, and even in a more general way, Bill Blakemore talks about how the movies are flip sides of each other, that if The Shining is about, you know, a family that falls mm-hmm. apart, Eyes Wide Shut is about a family, you know, that manages to stay together. Um, and in both of them, you know, the villains, you know, are these very, is, is a very corrupt upper class, you know, society. Mm-hmm. But that kind of goes all the way back to at least Paths of Glory, you know, where, you know, the, you, you know, where, you know, the most dangerous folks are the, are the, are the, are at the top of the ladder, um, you know, and that kind of recurs in a lot of his films and Barry Lyndon. So they all start to converge, um, you know, the, the the more you look at them. 
have, have you seen specific movie? I mean, um, for the kind of Russian doll process, I mean, your film, the film was in the film. Uh, did you get inspiration from other movies? I mean, for sure, besides Kubrick movies? Oh, sure. Like, um, well, one of, the, one of the inspirations, although it's a movie I haven't seen in over 10 years, would be Errol Morris's uh, Thin Blue Line, um, which is a documentary, you know, about um, inv investigating a murder and what's, and a couple things about it you know, that really made a huge impression on me. Number one is told through multiple points of view that he interviews different witnesses and he um, reenacts the scene according to each of their points of view and they get sort of increasingly complicated. There's also a very simple aesthetic, like the recreations that he does are framed on simple like kind of black voids. And he has this, um, and he uses a Philip Glass soundtrack that's kind of repetitive and meditative and has a almost like a religious aspect. And I always thought that, you know, that the 80s horror soundtracks of that day, like music by Goblin or Tangerine, John Carpenter. Carpenter, that that music was related, you know, mm -hmm. and that there was sort of a, a meditative, quasi-religious quality to that music too that mm -hmm. made the implication of what we're seeing bigger. Like, you know, you're watching... You know, a a any of those movies, which might be kind of small horror movies, but there's an implication that the characters in them are sort of surrogates for mankind, and that if they fail a test, it's going to have implications for uh, for, ev for everybody. <laughs> sure. um, so in a, there's an aesthetic that comes out of fr from some of those things, as well as there was a um, there was a a television documentary when I was a kid. I don't know if they if they played it up here. It was called In Search of Leonard Nimoy from Star Trek was the host. Okay. Maybe it had a different title here. And he would invent, and it was a documentary and it would always be about things like UFOs or Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster. But it was in some ways a horror, a horror movie as well as being a documentary. You know, that people would talk about their experiences, you know, being abducted by aliens and it would be very atmospheric, dramatic music and it would scare the hell out of me when I was a little kid. You mentioned the first time you saw Shining, you, you ran away after yeah, yeah. a few minutes. What, what, was it because you were really young and scared or what? Well, I was scared and I was young, but I mean, I had at that point already seen, you know, I think Alien and Halloween, so it wasn't like I was scared of everything. Like, I was actually, you know, pretty good with horror movies back then, but The Shining was bigger and heavier, you mm. know, than, than any of those movies, um, you know, and it just cut through me like a knife. How old are you? Oh, I was 11 or 12. Okay. And when did you see it again then? It was a couple of years later. I was a teenager and by that point, you know, I'd seen most every, you know, horror movie of the time. So I, my, my thin had, sk had thickened up a little bit and I just found it kind of exciting, you know, um, um, you know, maybe even kind of funny. Um, and it's still, I mean, there's parts of it that are very funny, um, you know, which I love that, you know, there are, there are moments that are very funny, there are moments that are very scary, there are moments that are kind of heartbreaking, um, um, you know, it runs the course. Uh, and I also read that you've just been editing a documentary about Charlie Kaufman. Andy Kaufman. Andy, sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I like a lot Charlie, that's why I was... No, that's know. fine. And uh, what is your next project? Well, that's... not too personal or... Well, know? the Andy Kaufman thing comes out in just a couple months, in, in, in July, in America. Good. And it's a record, not a, not, not a film. So it... Oh, is it a, it's a record? Yeah, well, it's, uh, it's really interesting that the producer, Vernon Chapman, um, was trusted with 80 some hours of never of, of previously unheard um, um, tape cassettes, tape cassette recordings tape cassette. that and that the comedian Andy Kaufman had made largely secretly of um, of, of um, you know pranks and phone calls and like these weird routines that he would do with his, that that you know that, that that he would do with his family and friends and some of them are like really emotional and thick and in, in troubling, and then the two of us cut them down uh, to about an hour, and it's and are presenting it, you know, in, as some bizarre version of a comedy album. And he intended them, it's like you can hear him on the tape talking, about, talking right. that he's trying to, that he wants to make a very unusual, very real, um, you know, record. 
I think in the movie somebody says like when you observed uh, an object, it kind of changes the object yes. and your vision. Yeah, that was so how you so doing this movie has kind of affected your vision. I mean, as a human being and yeah. as an artist. Yeah, well, certainly it's made me much more open to ambiguity. Mm. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> if, 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 if nothing else, um, uh, in a way that I don't know if that's always necessarily beneficial, but, you know, I can, <laughs> it's, it's getting much easier for me to imagine, you know, multiple angles on, on, on most anything. <laughs> I've also just been seeming to, you know, just step into a hall of mirrors of synchronicities. And oh, you they, did. They keep appearing after one after another. Like, well, I mean, when we were at Sundance, when we appeared at Sundance, we were playing on a theater on a, on a street named Sidewinder, which is the road that leads up to the Overlook Hotel. When we opened in L.A., there was a Stanley Kubrick exhibit at our um, Contemporary Art Museum. So all of the um, all the lamp poles had Stanley Kubrick's name hanging from them. For our opening, like throughout the entire city, they all no. for the, for the museum show was there. For and a movie had just opened about the baseball player Jackie Robinson called Forty Two, which was you know the number on the back of his jersey. So half the billboard said Forty Two wow. <laughs> in oh, L.A. Yeah, and they just keep happening. You know, every, every, you know, everything related to the movie. It's you know, and this hotel is vaguely reminiscent of we felt the so. Overlook, we felt although in some ways. Maybe it's got some more. It, it, it goes beyond The Shining. Maybe closer to Barry Lyndon. <laughs> well, thank you. Oh, no, sure thing. Thank you, guys. My, I had a joke answer for a while, but then I grew tired. That we would only do that. We would get our make our focus even more narrow and make the sequel only about the black and white photo at the end.